Friday, we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is the Talk Show Hell Hate. And the more you listen, the more you know why. Good to be with you today. I hear fluttering in the audio. I hear it. I don't know why it is. Um, let me, tr- let me see. Oh, it's, it's not there now. Right. All right. All right. Well, all right. Praise the Lord. Anyway, uh, good to be with you today. Um, uh, I wanted to go over some things that we have been discussing in our um, addictions Bible study. Uh, someone contacted us this week, said that they had an an issue with an addiction. Um, of course, I preached on this a few months ago, and it was then that I said that back in, uh, I think it was 2016, 2015, somewhere around in there, you know, s- since being electrocuted, um, run over by cars a couple times, um, it you know, it left me dealing with a lot of pain. Um, I've had several back injuries that go all the way back to uh, my days working in construction. Um, and I can I can remember when pretty much all the, I have had three back surgeries and I can remember when all three injuries occurred. And sometimes it takes a while for the damage to really show up. But uh, something that I I absolutely believe with beyond any doubt whatsoever, there are states right now all over the country where there are class action lawsuits against pharmaceutical companies. And I believe this because they're suing pharma companies because these pharmaceutical companies were pushing these highly addictive painkillers. And now, you know, were the doctors getting these these kickbacks for it? I have, I number one, I don't know that for sure, but I don't doubt it at all. Because um, my my primary physician had me on this real mild, non addictive pain reliever, and I took it for years, never had a problem out of it. But then it just wasn't. It wasn't working, wasn't doing anything. And I had the nerve damage from being electrocuted. Plus, I had um, some lower back pain that, I mean, it was it was getting to where I'll tell you this. Um, I every chair I sat on, I had a heating pad. And I had that heating pad cranked as hot as you could get it just to bring some sort of relief to my lower back. When I finally did have surgery on my lower back, when this, the day of surgery, the surgeon took a look at it and he said, you've been sitting on a heat pad, haven't you? I said, yeah, how do you know? He said, the skin in your back is modeled, M-O-T-T-L-E-D. It's spotted. And he said, 
I almost, he said, I, I probably shouldn't do surgery on you. I went, what? He said, you've, you've ruined your skin with a heat pad. And I said, yeah, that's why I'm here because it hurts so bad. And he said, I don't want to do surgery on you because it, the, the wound won't heal. And I finally talked him into it. So, but anyway, he fixed the, he fixed the problem. And I would say probably 80% of the pain's gone away. But when I went to a pain management doctor, he immediately put me on um, Percocet, which is hydrocodone, 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 something. Anyway, three times a day. What they don't tell you about this kind of pain reliever is it does a really good job of covering the pain receptors in your brain, and it feels terrific, just like any other kind of sin does. So if anybody's listening to me and you're going to get all uppity and say, well, Hoggard's just a weakling. Your sin is no different than anybody else's, only mine was prescribed. So he puts me on Percocet three times a day. And, of course, you know, to me, I thought I won the lottery. Wow, I get to take these three times a day. And it didn't take but a few months until three, one pill three times a day wasn't enough. Because once you cover those pain receptors in your brain, your brain builds new pain receptors. So you take the same amount, but it's not enough anymore. And then you have to take more. And then the more you take, the more you need. The more you take, the more you need. It's that way with alcohol. It's that way with marijuana. It's that way with every drug. Well, I won't say every drug. But it's that way with a lot of stuff. And then it got up to where I was taking 10 at a time. That's a lot of pain pills. And then, of course, you run out. And when you run out, you are a miserable human being. So... Now, I will say that the pain management doctor um, recognized what was going on. And he said, we, we're going to get you we're going to get you off of those. And I mean, I, I was just a miserable human being. So, you know, I'd always told myself that, you know, at some point I'm going to tell people this because you know God's just put it in me to just be honest about me and I I read your letters and I've read your emails and you you don't have a problem with me being honest imagine that a preacher being honest and um so I, I I said to my wife, I said, at some point I'm going to talk about this and then maybe God will use this to help people. Well, a few months ago, I preached uh, some messages about addictions. 
And then I, I brought that out. And it, it was hard to do. It was hard to, for me to say because you're admitting a weakness. And this is not what we do as human beings. We don't admit weaknesses. We boast about strength, but we don't talk about our weaknesses. And uh, now I, I can honestly say, I really can. I can honestly say now that. I, I just don't want, I don't want pain pills anymore. I don't want them. Don't want anything to do with them. Have no desire to go back to that after knowing what it does. And, you know, besides that, you know, I don't know that you ever reset back to no matter how long you haven't taken any. I don't think you ever reset back to like it was before you ever started taking them. So if something comes up and I'm going to have surgery, I I probably won't have surgery because they, I just, I would be afraid they wouldn't be able to control my pain after the surgery. Uh, but anyway, what I, what I found out was there's a lot of people, a lot of people that deal with various kinds of addictions I have people call me all the time. They are addicted to prescription medications. And like I said, there is a lawsuit in the state of Missouri right now suing pharmaceutical companies and some of these doctors who are, who were getting kickbacks they in other words the doctor would prescribe the the pain pills the pharmaceutical company would reward the doctor financially for getting people hooked on pain pills that's a slime bag if you ask me but that's what's going on and so there's a lawsuit going on and I don't I don't really care to be a part of it, but that's, that's what's happening. And, but, but now the pendulum swinging the other way, when my wife had her cancer surgery, it was like pulling teeth to get her any kind of pain relief after her surgery. I mean, they almost didn't want to give it to her. And I'm just going, that's, that ain't right either. So anyway, um, but people are addicted to prescription medications, not just pain pills. Um, things like um, Adderall, which is a, a form of speed, I found out. Um, people are addicted to, of course, alcohol. People are addicted to... Um, Illegal drugs, marijuana, which is, this country is dumb. This country is stupid for voting in any kind of marijuana use. Absolutely insane. Here, here we are with a huge drug problem in this country. So the, the answer to the drug problem is legalize the drugs. Now it's not a problem. So I told you about what happened here in Festus, Missouri, very stupidly voted in medical marijuana, which was every state that's ever voted in medical marijuana it immediately is abused. Immediately. It doesn't take years for people to figure out how to do it. It's immediately abused. The day that that law came into effect, some psychiatrist somewhere set up, rented an uh, office space, a storefront on Main Street in Festus, Missouri, advertised medical marijuana cards people were lined 
up down the sidewalk waiting to get in this this little storefront to get their medical marijuana card. Somebody was passing them out a questionnaire. The questionnaire said things like, do you ever feel anxiety? Duh! Do you ever feel depressed? Do you ever uh, have low self-esteem? Do you ever... It's, and, and it's all these little softball questions like that and it actually told them on the paper for each answer you had to put like a number from you know one to ten of how much anxiety you had based on a scale of one to ten and it told you on the paper that you had to score a minimum of ten all together to qualify for a card. You you would have to be an idiot if you filled this out and got to the bottom and said, well, I'm only an eight. I, I guess I can't get my marijuana card. I'm only an eight. You're an idiot. They're the idiots for... But this guy, for $100 a piece... This psychiatrist was selling medical marijuana cards. He probably raked in two, three, two, three thousand dollars in one day. Easy. Maybe more than that. And it's and it's was and it's it was a setup from the beginning. It and then it's gonna turn into recreational use. So it's a I mean it's a huge problem. Uh, addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs, addicted to, uh, and, and get this. You remember that cup that Babylon holds in her hand? What's it got in it? Wine of fornication. And it's making people drunk. And that's another one that people are addicted to. They get addicted to, it used to be, years ago, magazines. But now, they don't buy magazines anymore. They just watch it on their phone Watch it on their computer. You, you have church members all over this country who are addicted to fornication, addicted to it, and can't stop. Now, did God foresee all of this? Yes. Is it wrong? Absolutely. Every bit of it is wrong. There are other types of addictions. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that it had to be some sort of chemical addiction like to alcohol or drugs or even fornication some people are addicted to attention. They constantly require the camera on them all the time. They constantly require everybody's attention. They constant or some people are addicted to uh, control. They constantly have to be in charge of everything. Everything in their life, everything that surrounds them, everybody around them has to do what they tell them to do. That in itself is another form of addiction. There are some people who are depressed 
and they don't like being not depressed. They don't like it. They don't like being happy. They're addicted to depression. And so it, it is a constant, everything's bad, everything's awful, everything's terrible. Uh, you know, of course, now we have, I'm going to say an internet addiction, but it's not necessarily related to fornication. Some people are addicted to social media. And it in, you know, they cannot deal with real life because they are constantly on their phone, on their tablet, on the computer, non-stop they're on that. Now, um, I want to go to um, what I do. Man. That doesn't sound good, does it? There we go. Um, I want to go to, um, let's see here. Let's go to Luke chapter 4. And Luke chapter 4, uh, Jesus is describing to everybody why he, why he, why he came, why he showed up. Luke chapter 4, of course, Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. Now, there's, you know, one thing about those of us who are ad addicted, and, and those of you who say, well, I don't look at dirty pictures, and I don't smoke, and I don't drink, and I don't take drugs, and I, I'm a pretty good guy. You, you could be addicted to pride. And anything that makes you look good, ev everything has to have you coming out on top. Everything does. Everything is about you and how you look. And I've met people like that. Um, I'll, I'll mention a name because, I mean, this guy is just, he's reprobate. Um, his name is Rob Skiba. And first time I met him, he, he spoke at a conference that I was at in Branson, Missouri. And um, we didn't get along very instantly. And when I found out his position on the Bible, I just went, this guy's, this guy's nuts. Um, uh, and I found out that he used to be an actor and a male model. Now, male models are all about image. And if, if whatever makes them look good, that's what they want to be. So he was steeped into Hebrew roots. But he didn't like anybody calling him Hebrew roots. He would say, I don't, I don't like to be called Hebrew roots, but I believe in the Hebrew roots. Then he, he goes off the deep end, goes, falls off the edge of the earth because now he's a flat earther. And, he, and you'll hear him say, I don't like to be called a flat earther, but I believe the earth is flat. Well, you're, a f and it, and it really, it's all about how he looks. He doesn't like the titles that people give him because of who he is and what he believes and what he says, but that's who he is and what he says. If you go quack, 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 you're a duck. Well, I don't like to be called a duck, but you're a duck. That's what you are. And so some people are addicted to their pride, their image. And that could be just as bad. So Luke chapter 4, here's Jesus now, the author and finisher of our faith, the captain, the, the chief soldier among us. 
who are fighting the battle of sin, who himself was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, some might tell you, well, if Jesus can do it, you can do it too. No, Uh uh-uh. Jesus did it because none of us can do it. It's not possible. And I've made this illustration before. Adam and Eve were living in paradise on earth, having food all around them, not even, and, and never knew what hunger was. And here they get tempted with eating this fruit that God said, don't eat. And they could have just been munching on celery and apples all day long. And then all of a sudden, the devil tempts Eve with this other fruit, and she dives right into it. But here's Jesus, 40 days he's not eaten. 40 days he's not eaten a bite. And that's about the limit. You're getting pretty close. Once you get into 30, 40 days without food, you're you're getting close to death. 40 days without food, and yet the devil tempts him, and he prevails. But the, the point of that story is not to say, Jesus did it. There's no reason why you shouldn't do it. That's not the point. The point is our Savior, our God, our best friend in the whole world knows what it is to be tempted, knows what it's like to suffer weakness and to have a weak disposition. And all of us, in one form or another, have a weak disposition. There's some things you can tempt me with and some things you could put in my face all day long and I'd just go and get that out of my face. Did wouldn't bother me a bit in the world. And it's like that with everybody. So Luke chapter 4, here's Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. And he uses the word of God to endure the temptation. Now, one of the reasons why we started an addictions Bible study and not just an AA meeting. It's, this is not an AA meeting. This is not us. Well, I'm Mike H. I, I've been this. I do this. And what? I, it's not an AA meeting. Because what good does it do for somebody to be drug free for the rest of their life? And die and go to hell. So I don't I don't have any doubt that some people are helped with various addictions programs. I don't have any doubt at all about that. But then they're still going to die and stand before God. And if you think God's gonna say, Well, you were in AA and you've got your you know, you were you were dry for twenty years. I'll let you in because you were a you were an AA. God's not going to do that. So it's to it's to teach people, especially in this world, because sin, the sin's not going away. We're not going to wake up one day, big headlines across the the paper and across the internet. Sin suddenly disappears off planet Earth. That's not going to happen. It's getting worse. And, you know, let's think about it. In the 60s, when I was born, marijuana was very illegal. 
and just for possessing a little nickel bag or a dime bag of marijuana, you go to jail for 10, 15 years. Um, back in, back in those days, back in the sixties, most, most areas of the country prohibited the sales of pornographic magazines. You couldn't find them anywhere. Um, in fact, before Hugh Hefner, I mean, there may have been a few, I mean, I don't know the history of pornography, but before Hugh Hefner, it just, I don't know that there was any. What I'm saying now is the sins and people's, uh, people's ability to get into sin it's a lot easier now than it ever has been before. Ever. Now marijuana is legal in, in a lot of places in this country. Uh, porn is everywhere. It's coming in on televisions. It's coming in through the Internet. It is everywhere. Drugs. My goodness, the CIA was bringing drugs into this country and probably still is. CIA ought to be disbanded, burned to the ground as far as I'm concerned for doing stuff like that. People like that should go to prison or executed. I don't know. But the sin now... It's a lot easier to get to. I personally don't know anybody who deals in drugs, but I could make a phone call. I could make one phone call and get in contact with somebody else, and you probably could too. So that's how easy this stuff is to get, to get our hands on. So here's why Jesus, here's why Jesus came. This is what he said. After he withstood the devil in the wilderness, in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Delivers, there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. When he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. I like that. I like that. By, by the way, you pray for Kenya, Turkana, and Samburu. Both of which, if you've heard, there's a plague, another locust plague moving through Africa. It has gone through Turkana and Samburu. Those people did not need a plague of locusts. They did not need that. And locusts eat everything and leave nothing behind. So He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now, some of you, your addictions started at a very young age. Whether it was drugs, I know a guy, he's done prison time because of his drug abuse. But he said his older brothers, and this was a, a Christian family, supposedly. I know the mom and dad were, but his older brothers 
He caught them smoking marijuana. They were teenagers. He was, this guy was probably maybe 11, 12 years old. And when he caught them, they grabbed him. And they stuck that joint in his mouth. And they made him smoke it. And he said, and they said, now you're not going to tell. Because you did it too. And he said, Mike, that was the beginning of my drug experience. I was pulled into it. And he said, I've been hooked on it ever since. I was with him when they, he, he had violated his parole. He called me, wanted me to go with him. I'd, I'd known him since childhood. I went with him, prayed with him. But they carted him off to jail right then and there, violated his probation. But some of that stuff gets started at childhood. Some of you suffer things to this day because things were done to you as a child. I'm sorry that that happened. But it happens to a lot of people. And Jesus came to, to heal those broken hearts. To preach deliverance to the captives. That's who you are. And addiction is captivity. Recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he said in verse 21, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, one of the things I want to say to you is, number one, Jesus is the friend of sinners. Sinners of all kinds. Even those who have practiced sodomy. Jesus is a friend to sinners. There are, I have absolutely no doubt, there are people who have committed acts of sodomy that God has saved and still can save. I don't care what Steven Anderson says. I don't like him anyway. There's still people there that God can reach and God can save them. And I'll be honest with you. I my my firm belief is a lot of that, maybe not all of it, but a lot of that is imposed upon them while they were children. While they were children. Male and female, doesn't matter. So, Christ's whole mission here on earth is to save sinners and to be a friend to sinners and to help deliver people from repetitive sins. Mormon doctrine, um, Finnis Dake's doctrine, who's the grandfather of the Word, Faith, Charismatic movement, and maybe some others basically says that if you sin, yes, God will forgive you if you repent. However, you are to never do that sin again or you didn't really repent. And they make up this saying about repentance, meaning, God, I'm sorry, and I promise you I will never do it again. And they say 
that if you go out and do it again, it is obvious that you didn't really repent. Therefore, you're not saved or you lost your salvation or um, and, and in some cases, like with Mormon doctrine, like with Finnis Dake, they say that God then unforgives the previous sin. And now you're held accountable for all the old sins again, which is not biblical. It's not right. That is not God. Once a sin is forgiven, it is forgiven forever. How long? And I'll, I mean, just ask the question, how long does God's mercy last? His mercy endureth forever. You look that up. I wonder how many times that's in our beloved King James Bible. Mercy endureth. 41 times in the King James Bible. Uh, and all in the Old Testament, most of them in the Psalms. So, for those who have varying issues with, and we'll call them repetitive sins. Now, the Bible, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, and for instruction in righteousness. The Bible is our guide to teach us how to no longer live wrong, but how to live right. And how to not keep repeating the same sins over and over and over again. And, and again, I'll bring this issue up of repetitive sin. So I've, I've, heard, so I've heard preachers that I know personally who have said that if you are into a repetitive sin— you may not be saved at all. Now, I would never, I would never challenge them publicly on it. I would, I, I might talk to them privately about it, the way it should be done. I would never want to lose fellowship with somebody like that. But I don't know of any. I don't know of anybody who has never repeated a sin. I don't know that person. Let me give you the Romans road of salvation. These are the verses that we give to someone if we're leading them to Christ. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. So the things that I'm saying today apply to everybody because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Number two, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. I like what I heard about this the other day. The wages versus the gift. Hell is what you earned. Heaven is what you didn't earn. It was given to you as a gift by God. Why did he give you that gift? Because he loved you. And if God gave you the gift of eternal life, doesn't God know you? Doesn't God have some sort of idea who you are? And doesn't God know that you didn't just sin once, you sinned a lot of times? And didn't God know when he accepted you into his kingdom, didn't God know that you had an area of life that was a serious problem and you didn't know how you were ever going to get out of it? Didn't God know that? Yeah. 
He did. Of course he knew it. He knew it. Or he he knew it. And that's probably why he saved you to begin with. Because you're the kind of people that he's looking for. They that are whole don't need the physician, but they that are sick. And Jesus looks at some of us and says, oh, they need me. They need me. So the, the wages of sin is death. Get to God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Didn't say anything in there about whosoever believeth in him and sinneth not should have it. Didn't say anything in there about that. Now, John deals with that. John deals with the idea of people who say, well, if you're a Christian, you don't sin. So, uh, 1 John, let's see, that would be, oh, yeah, it's all in 1 John. Um, how about first John one, seven, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does God just say that to those who are who he is saving right then and there? Or does he say it to all of us that whenever we sin, even if it's a repeated sin, there is still forgiveness with God. As long as there is godly sorrow that goes with it. Because you know how kids are. Say you're sorry. Sorry! Well, we know that doesn't really, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't count. Okay? But I've had children, my children, come to me. Sorry, Dad. Man, my heart melts. Whoa. For a child to do that? That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, let's see here. Uh, 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. But he's not done. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So if God knows we are sinners, and we are, as long as this flesh abides, it is going to do evil. And sometimes whether the addiction is a mental addiction or a physical addiction. In other words, there could be, you know, um, I, I took a medicine, what was it, Cymbalta, for a while. And, um, you know, it's part of the pain management thing and the nerve damage that was done. But I didn't really, I didn't really, it didn't really benefit me and it kept me awake at night. It wouldn't let me sleep. So I would just quit taking it. Well, I noticed that I started having these little convulsions like that where I felt like I was being electrocuted for like, you know, a half a second. Which I can tell you, for somebody like me, that's very unnerving. I don't like the feeling of being electrocuted again. 
Well, come to find out, that was one of the side effects of just quitting the medicine. When you, when you take it for a while and you quit it, part of the withdrawal of that is you get these shocks in your nerves. I didn't like that at all. But I had to go through it. So there, there's some medicines that you don't just quit. You have to be slowly taken off of them. And it's that way with sin. Some sins, when, when people get saved, some things they just quit doing. They just don't do it anymore. I know a couple. He's a pastor, in fact. Back before he started living for the Lord, him and his wife, buddy, they visited the bars and they drank and she drank a lot. He drank a lot and he used to love to get in fights and I mean, just all kinds of things. When the Lord got a hold of him, when it came time to quit drinking, he quit. He just quit. His wife, however, her body reacted to the alcohol in a way that she couldn't take cold medicine, you know, like NyQuil, or she had to be careful about how food was cooked in a restaurant, if it was cooked in any kind of wine or anything like that, she couldn't. Because her body was different, her chemical makeup. She had this chemical addiction to alcohol. And she's been dry for, I'm going to say probably 40 years, maybe. 30 years, 40 years, something like that. But she can never again allow alcohol to enter into her body. That's the way she is. So some people have a like a chemical addiction. Some people have mental addictions. My father-in-law, our deacon, Brother Sterling, used to smoke cigarettes years ago. And you got to know Sterling. He's pretty tight with money. Okay? And... This is back in the 60s, and he kept seeing the price of a pack of cigarettes go up. He told his wife, Gloria, if cigarettes ever get to 25 cents a pack, don't buy them for me no more. I ain't paying for them. So he comes home one day from work. Gloria, where's my cigarettes? Well, you told me they were 25 cents a pack not to buy you any. Well, they went up to 25 cents a pack, so I didn't buy you any. Okay, I'm quitting. Now, for him, he, you, you know what the hardest thing was for him to quit smoking was? He had to stop slapping his pocket because, you know, them guys carried them cigarettes in their pockets and they hit their pocket all the time. And he said, I kept doing that for months. But other than that, didn't have a problem with it. Now, other people I've known, Quitting smoking was one of the hardest things they ever done. Does not God know that? Yes. So when it comes to our addictions, yes, there are some things God delivers us from, just boom, they're gone. But he also understands, and God is patient. He that hath begun a good work in you will finish it, the Bible says. God doesn't just instantly do all the work all at once. No. God didn't even, when it came to uh, 
delivering the Is- the Israelites, bringing them into the promised land, God could have killed all of the enemies in the land all at once, all one day. They're all dead. But God didn't do it that way. He said, lest when you get there, the whole town be full of beasts. So I'm going to take them little by little. Or I think the exact words are, I'm going to look that up, by little and little, I think. Let me find that verse. I love that. When I read that, I'm going, that's it. That's how God does it. He doesn't always just take them all away, all at once. He does it. Let's see here. Where at? Where is that? No. No. No, I know it's in there somewhere. No, no, no. Yeah. Deuteronomy 7.22. The, let me go back to um, seven Deuteronomy 7.20. Moreover, the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them until they that are left and hide themselves from thee be destroyed. Thou shalt not be affrighted at them, for the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God and terrible. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beast of the field increase upon thee. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee, and thou shalt destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. God said, little by little. And I can tell you, I can tell you that that's how God works in a truly born-again person's life. Little by little. Let's just deal with today. Now, I'm going to work on you today. Now, tomorrow, we're going to work on you some more. But let's not worry about tomorrow. Let's just take care of today. So, um, why, why is there... So much sin out there. Why is it plaguing so much? Why is it having such an effect upon good families? Why is it reaching into the church? Why did God make so many sins to exalt Christ? And, 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 and to keep us from boasting about our own self-righteousness. I mean, after all, you know, and I've used this illustration before. If there was, let's say, a hundred people living in the Garden of Eden, and there was that tree there in the midst of the garden, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of that tree. Well, if it was a grapefruit, God tells me, Mike, whatever you do, don't you dare eat of that fruit. God, I guarantee you, you got nothing to worry about for me because I hate grapefruits. I hate them. I don't like sour stuff to begin with. And grapefruits are a horrible fruit. Now, some people, oh, they love their grapefruit. They love the grapefruit juice, and they love eating grapefruits, and that just, I hate them. But there's somebody out there who loves them. Somebody, somebody's eating them, or they wouldn't grow them. And see, that's my point. Just because one person 
is hooked on something or addicted to something or that that's the sin that they love and you don't love that sin, does that make you any better than them? Answer is no. Because the fruit there could have been a banana. I like bananas. Or pears. I like pears. Or white peaches. Oh, I love white peaches. Now that would have been a problem for me. See, that's my point. So why does God make so many? Romans 7, 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. In the Garden of Eden, there was only one sin. By the time Moses and the law shows up, now there's all kinds of sins. And notice that the Ten Commandments, in the Ten Commandments, there's nothing about eating certain fruits off a tree. In fact, that I can think of, there's not a prohibition in the law anywhere from eating any kind of fruit. None. There were certain kind of animals they couldn't eat, but fruit, no, nah, eat all the fruit you want. Notice that. God made sin exceeding sinful. But why did he do that? So that everybody, if you read Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, you find out why God did it. God made it so that all are concluded under sin. There is none righteous, no, not one. So to those of you, I had a guy call me the other day, and he's got a double whammy going. Pornography and marijuana. Okay. And he needed some encouragement. He needed some help. So, you know, he's one of the reasons why I'm talking about this, but I've had other people contact me since then. Romans 5. Let's look at Romans 5 for a minute. Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength... In due time, like, like Christ, 40 days in the wilderness. How many uh, kickboxing matches can he get into after fasting for 40 days? How many touched out, touched, how many, uh, you know, touchdown runs can he run? How many home runs can he hit? How many hurdles can he jump? He's weak. For when we were yet without strength, when sin, whatever it was, whether it was alcohol, meth, marijuana, cocaine, opiates, porn, pride, gluttony, whatever. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 
For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So when we look then at verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, meaning Adam, who had one commandment and only one sin, for if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Now, let me, let me stop here. Think of um, the woman who anointed Jesus washed his feet with her tears, dried his feet with her hair. And the self-righteous religious people said, Jesus, if you knew what kind of woman this was touching you, you wouldn't have her touching you. I guarantee you, if you knew what kind of sinner she was, Jesus said, well, I know what kind of sinner she is. And she's a lot better than the people whose house I'm in. I mean, I come in here. You offer me no anointing. You do not wash my feet. She has not ceased to wash my feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. Jesus loves sinners. Honest sinners. Honest ones. For some reason, and this really bothers me, The person who gets lied to the most is me. By people that I know. They, they don't tell me that things aren't going well. They don't tell me that they're really struggling with sin. I won't say all of them, but some of them. Some people just flat out lie to me through their teeth. And all I want to do with somebody is help them. I'm not looking to condemn people. I'm not looking to cast people out. I'm not looking to throw people under the bus or to parade them in front of the church. Look what kind of person that is. I'm not looking to do that. I like honesty when it comes to people and their sins. They don't have to tell me everything. But my goodness, I already know that everybody that I know is a sinner. I already know it. I know it about 
my wife. I know it about my daughters. I know it about my sons. I know it about all their families. I know it about everybody in my church. I know they're sinners. There's one guy in our church that I have the greatest respect for him. And it's Roy. Roy always lets me talk about the fact that he's been an alcoholic, a drunk, all his life. Took his first drink when he was a boy. He's been dry 30 years. And he's living now with the damage done by the alcohol to his body. And he takes it pretty hard. He has a hard time dealing with it. But I like him. He comes to our addictions Bible study every Thursday night. And if I ever have an illustration that I need, I can always talk about Roy. He doesn't mind. Because he's like me in a lot of ways. The things that I've gone through, the things that I've endured, I want to use that to help people. So don't lie anymore about what's wrong in your life. Don't lie anymore to cover up things that you've done. No, I don't need to know all of it. I'll need to know all the details. But don't make me think that everything with you is okay when it's not. Because you can end up deceiving everybody around you so much, you'll end up deceiving yourself. That's possible. And you'll end up believing your own lies. Everything's fine. I'm good. And I don't buy it. So I, I, Jesus loves, and I love, honest sinners. Church members that will be honest and say, if it wasn't for the grace of God, if it wasn't for God having mercy on me, even to this day, I wouldn't be here. So the first thing, if you have any kind, any kind, maybe you lie a lot. I know somebody that just, they can't tell us, they can't speak a sentence without throwing something in there that ain't true. I don't know what kind of addiction that is, but it's a problem. It's not something that God can't fix, though. And whether he decides to fix it overnight or whether he decides he's going to take 10 years. And, and let me address this. If God has decided with you that he's going to take 10 years to deliver you from your, from your sinful addiction. Is God going to have mercy on you throughout those 10 years? The answer is yes, of course he is. Why wouldn't he? And, and another question. If you asked God to deliver you from what's going on in your life, from, from whatever it is, your alcohol, your marijuana, your cigarettes, your drugs, your porn, your whatever. If you ask God to forgive you and deliver you from them, it is because you've reached the conclusion that you can't stop it yourself. 
And it goes along with the same idea where Jesus asked the question, which one of you, just by thinking, can add a cubit to your stature? That's 18 inches. I mean, I can't even add an inch to my stature just by thinking, much less a cubit. So if you can't think yourself tall, then you can't think yourself righteous. You don't have the ability to do it. But people like Joel Olstein, Joyce Myers, all these other people, these, these life coaches that pose as preachers, they'll make you convinced that you can, th there's a book that, you know, I, years ago, Lisa and I got into Amway. That's, yeah, I know. And they, they kept giving us, or they didn't give them to us, we had to buy them, all these motivational tapes to listen to. And then every month we'd get a book to read by some motivational person. One of them was called Think and Grow Rich. And it, all it was was the law of attraction witchcraft. That's what it was. Think and Grow Rich. And they used to take us out, you know, in order to get us to sell more Amway products and sign more people up. They'd say, let's go out dream building. You know what that is? They take you out and they say, what do you like? Do you like boats? Do you like RVs? Do you like houses? Do you like cars? Let's go look at, let's go to the car lot and let's look at some new cars. And what they were doing was they were getting us to lust after all these things so that we would sell more product. Okay. But it's the idea that you can think yourself rich, make yourself wealthy by thinking it. Think positive, rich thoughts. And then all of a sudden you're rich. You're selling more than everybody else is. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's a lie. It's a setup. If you could have stopped doing what you're doing, you would have done it already. And you wouldn't need God. But you can't. You can't and you won't ever be able to by yourself. Never. You need help. You need help. So you ask God to deliver you. God, deliver me from this. God, please take this away from me. Similar to what Paul was asking God to remove that thorn. And God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. For when you are weak, Paul, then I am made strong. So, if you ask God to take this addiction out of you, Somebody's going to, I guarantee you, somebody's going to come along and say to you, well, God wants you to take the first step, though. Or God, God's waiting for you to do it. But remember, you don't know how to do it. And you can't think just positive thoughts, and then all of a sudden the inclination to commit sin goes away. I had a guy tell me one time, he said he used to be in a cult and they were all about self-righteousness and personal purity and you, how you could, you know, live clean life all the time, never have any problems. And he said to me, he said, uh, I heard, and he said, I believe it that 
if you remain pure for how long was it he said 21 days then after that you don't you don't lust after women anymore and i went Really? I said, try it. Try it. It doesn't work that way. But he was told that by somebody who said, it works for me. And I said, whoever told you that was lying through their teeth. If all you had to do was to complete a 21-day course of remaining pure, what do we need Jesus for? Let me keep reading Romans 5. Um... Romans 5, 16, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment, judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's sin death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. That's why there's so much of it out there. And I'll, I'll say it in a, in a way of uh, Bible prophecy. That's why there's so much of it out there right now, and it's getting more and more and more. Sin is growing. The leaven is leavening the lump. Big! That lump is huge by now. So that it absolutely is going to be known at the time of Christ appearing who is and who isn't. It's going to be that the just really do live by faith and not of works. So, moreover the law, this is Romans 5.20, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. But, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. So that's, that's why. There's so much sin out there, so many wrong things for you to get into, and so much of it to get addicted to. And again, there's, there's a difference between a, a physical chemical addiction to a substance like, uh, you know, like nicotine or alcohol or opiates or methamphetamine or marijuana or whatever. You get hooked on it. Or there's the, the mental addiction where your brain keeps telling you, you've got to have this, you need this, you need to do this again, and so on. Now,
Here's how it starts. 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. I mean, me personally, I had, why do you smoke cigarettes? Do you not know that they stink? Now, a pipe, I can understand. A pipe, to me, smells good. My grandfather smoked a pipe, and I loved it when he smoked a pipe because it smelled so good. But how come cigarettes don't smell like pipes? They stink! Ugh! But apparently... The nicotine gives you a sort of a buzz or a relaxed feeling or whatever. That's lust of the flesh. Why else would someone be tempted to smoke or someone, when they're nervous, they want a cigarette to calm them down? <laughs> the nicotine in it the drug makes you feel good i mean if if painkillers all if all they did was stop pain there wouldn't be so many people getting hooked on it but painkillers don't just stop pain they feel good don't they Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. It feels pretty good. Yep. That's lust of the flesh. James 1.15, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth... Listen to, the, listen to the baby terms here. This is a birthing a child like the man of sin. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And now you have people dying everywhere because of heroin. And the fentanyl that's in it is so... That's what killed Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson owned his own physician. He owned his own personal doctor. He didn't make an appointment and go sit in a waiting room and read old magazines about golf while he was waiting on his doctor. He had his own private physician that worked for him exclusively. And that doctor was dosing him with fentanyl. It killed him. Because it's a powerful drug. And so these people are dying right and left. Do you think that stop, does that stop people from wanting to take heroin? No. But sure as the world, lust when it's conceived bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Sure as the world. And in today's world, not even seeing the death, did, did people dying of AIDS stop people from being sodomites or adulterers? Because I know somebody who is, he, he is addicted to adultery. He is addicted to adultery. Uses apps on his phone to hook up. All the time. He's got AIDS over it. Did that stop him? Nah. That didn't stop him at all. Didn't stop him. His death will stop him. But somebody else's death? They don't stop people. 
Genesis 3, we all know that story. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. That was a lie, lest ye die. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil well that's a and and that that is going to be the temptation that compels all men to get the mark of the beast i guarantee you it is going to be related to the idea that when they receive the mark they will become gods and live forever guarantee you that's it which is why god then offers us the gospel which will give us then the power to make the decision on that day to say you take your mark and shove it up your nose i'm not taking it you can kill me i'm not taking it in fact if you kill me I'll be happier than I've ever been because then I'll get eternal life without your mark. So up your nose with your mark, buddy. Um, for God doth know in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw lust of the eyes, that's, that's your pornography, lust of the eyes. We have to see it. Lust of the flesh. Tree desired, uh, it was good for food. Lust of the flesh. Pleasant to the eyes. Lust of the eyes. Tree to be desired to make one wise. Pride of life. She took the fruit thereof, did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And addictions, if they're emotional addictions, it's because... They make you feel good. They make you feel good. They give you some sort of satisfaction somehow, some way. That's why I said earlier that some people are addicted to uh, power because it makes Hitler. Hitler had to have been addicted to power. There, there wasn't enough of the world to conquer. He didn't just take over Czechoslovakia and Poland and say, you know what? I got enough. We'll let the French be the French. Let the British be the British. I have enough. To people like that, you know, and Hitler, he wasn't a drunkard. He was married, but everybody's like, did he even consummate the marriage? Because he clearly didn't want women. What he wanted, what he was addicted to, was power. And what are you going to do then, Adolf, if you conquer the whole world? Where are you going to go then? What are you going to do? There's nothing left to conquer. So some of it is emotional addiction. It makes us feel good. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. Why? Because I just, I feel good doing it. Um... I mentioned this earlier. Most, but not all, most addictions stem from childhood. 
Let me read Revelation 12. There appeared a, a great wonder in heaven. This is verse 1. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. She being with child cried travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold a great red dragon dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven did cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born You think about that. Most porn addictions or sodomy addictions or adulterous lifestyles begin in childhood. Maybe you were introduced to dirty magazines at a young age. Maybe the kids down the street had them and you went down there and he let you see them. Or maybe your daddy had them or whatever. Maybe you were introduced to adultery at a young age by an older uncle, aunt, neighbor, cousin, brother, sister. People, I've heard, it, I've heard it all. I have. I've heard it all. People have victimized children so much in this world. It's not just America. It's all over the world. And that... that lingers with them for the rest of their life. And once introduced to that at a young age, doesn't go away easily because that's how their brain's wired. The formative years of a child's life is when connections are made in their brain. And a child raised in a seemingly healthy environment, loving environment, trained and disciplined properly, they, they tend to, not always, but they tend to at least have a chance at life to live it in a decent way. But that's getting to be a very rare thing. A lot of adults out there right now were abused as children. A lot of them. Introduced to things that they should have never but the devil loves to go after the children. They're always his target. Always. Hitler knew that. That's why he formed the Hitler Youth. Let's get them while they're young. Let's indoctrinate their minds. Let's pick out these blonde-haired, blue-eyed children. 
Let's fill them with this ideology that they are a superior race to everybody else on the earth. Therefore, they have the right to rule over all of mankind. And so the devil, I mean, you, and you have clear examples of this in the Bible. You have, number one, Revelation 12 dragon wanting to consume the child as soon as it's born. Pharaoh wanting all the Hebrew children to be murdered, slaughtered. Why? Because all them Jews do is breed. That's all they do. Well, let's work them to death. Make them too tired. Well, that didn't work. So he just killed them. The days of when Christ came, Herod was there. There was a one child that Herod was afraid of. So in his attempt to slaughter the one child, he just killed them all two years old and younger. But he missed that one. And I, I believe, and I really do. I, you know how, you know how they say dogs can smell fear. On somebody. I, I believe that. I believe that. Animals can sense things that, you know, humans just can't. We just don't have it. But animals can sense things. It's survival. It's protection. And I think, I think the devil has the ability to, to sense in someone that they are going to be a threat when they grow up. I do. I, th I think the devil, I mean, I, I have talked to a lot of people. The pastor I know. Severely abused, raped by an uncle. Raped by an uncle. Tried to destroy this boy at a young, tender age. And yet God prevailed. Now he's got problems. Don't get me wrong. He's got he's got issues. But God can use him. And I think the devil goes after people at a young age because I think he senses something about them. This person's protect. Look at all those angels around that child. Look at the number of spirits that are protecting that child. There's got to be something about that child that is going to destroy me. Well, I will absolutely destroy that child. Tried to do it to me. Tried to do it to you. And so a lot of these addictions, whether they're drugs, adultery, or you name it, was the devil getting to you in your age of innocence to put you in chains of bondage forever so that you never stand a chance to serve God. But I can tell you that my God is greater. My good Good friend, Pastor Lordson Rock from India, grew up in the slums. He was a slum dog. And in India, because of the caste system, if you were born in the slums, according to them, 
It's because karma selected you to be born in the slums. And who are we to argue with karma? Therefore, you're going to be poor the rest of your life. You're never going to be given a job, a decent one. You're never going to be given a decent wage. You're not going to be hired for, you're not going to go to university. You are, you were, a, you were determined by the universe to be in the slums. And that's how you're going to stay. Day. And God saved that man, brought him out of it. And he says, only God determines my, the outcome of my life, not karma. Somebody say amen. But the devil got you as a child. hooked you into, or set it up so that, you know, I watched a documentary about a particular town in Kentucky, I think is what it was. You had a lot of people ended up dying. And uh, there was a cover-up by the sheriff's department, but it, and it had to do with drugs going on in this particular county. And the sheriff was involved in it. But you had all these people getting hooked on heroin. And they all said this. I was in a car accident. Or I got injured. And they put me on painkillers. The painkillers didn't do the trick. So I turned to heroin. Sometimes that's how it starts. But the devil sets it up. He sets it up for you to fall. Now, um, you know, that's all, that's all about a lot of how these addictions or these lifestyles start. But what about... If you're saved, how can you be delivered from them? And what some people want, which is why they go to listen to the word, faith, charismatic, witchcraft people, is that they want the magic words that makes it disappear. And there aren't any. There are none. If there were, they would be in your Bible. You would simply say these words and bam, no more sin. But there aren't any. God takes each case as it comes to him, and he decides then how he's going to do, with, do it or how he's going to deal with it or how long it's going to take. And, and it's like I said earlier, if God wanted to deliver you instantly, he will. And in some things, he has. But if God says, I'm going to do this, but I'm, I'm going to spend 20 years doing it, or 10 years, or 5 years, or 30 years, or the rest of your life. If that's what God decides, God then has already decided that he's going to work godly sorrow in you so that he chastens you, you repent, and you move on. 2 Corinthians 7. This is for all of you Stephen Anderson and 
and others who say that I preach a work salvation because I say you have to repent. If you don't repent, don't plan on asking God for salvation. If you're not ever sorry for your sins, why are you wanting God to save you to begin with? 2 Corinthians 7. You know what? I'm going to pull that up and read the context. I'm going to start in, I have it in my notes to start in verse 10. But I'm going to back up a little bit. For some reason, I think God's telling me to back up a little bit. Yeah. Verse 8. 2 Corinthians 7, Paul said, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceived that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Now, verse 10, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to what? Salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Here's, here's what God does. Now, if, if, if you're afraid because of a repetitive sin that after God forgives you the first time, he's not going to forgive you no more. If God punishes you, he's going to forgive you. If God bears down on you so hard and so mean that you cry out to God, of course he's going to forgive you. So look at what he said. Verse 11, for behold this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. You know what, you know what that did? God started making you care whether or not you did this or not. What carefulness it wrought in you. God started making you more aware of what brings this on, what triggers it. What carefulness it wrought in you. Oh, so you mean... If I don't want to drink anymore, you mean I have to quit going to bars? Really? Uh, yeah. But I only go to play pool. Then why do you end up drinking? Save the money you would have spent on beer. Buy a pool table. Put it in your house. Play pool all you want to. But anyway... What, what what care it wrought in this, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves. Having an undefiled conscience, I'm telling you, is one of the best things in the world to have. An undefiled conscience. You can either have a clean conscience. Or one seared with a hot iron. For behold, this self same thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. That's it right there. Number one, repentance, godly sorrow that brings repentance. 
You just saying, God, I'm sorry from henceforth here on. I will always be sorry for my sins. Uh, in your name, amen. God, I wrote this for you. So every time I sin, read it. That's not, God's going, that's not sorrow. You want to know what sorrow is, Mike? Mike, you want to know what sorrow is? I'm fixing to show you what sorrow is. Uh, boy, I wasn't, and I can tell you, God can scare you to death, making you sorry over one sin. I guarantee you he can do it. But look at what it does very quickly. Number one, it clears you. Then it gives you indignation. It makes you mad at the devil for setting you up like this. It burns you. It makes you it makes you want to cut the cord on your internet. Makes you want to empty all your whiskey bottles out. Throw out all the beer you've got in the refrigerator. Burn that dime bag of marijuana. Makes you want to do all of that stuff because you say, I don't want anything to do with this stuff ever again. Want nothing to do with it anymore. That's what that is. What indignation. Yea, what fear. Because when God bore down on you, people, there's been times. I'm not kidding you. I wasn't sure I was going to live through it. Am I going to make it? Then it says, what vehement desire, what zeal, what revenge. God, I hate this. And God, with your grace, I want to go after all the devils that ever brought this into my life. God, I want them thrown in the lake of fire so bad. In fact, God, this may not be allowed, but when it comes time to throw these devils into the lake of fire, would you let me do it? You know what I think? The Bible says we're going to be judging angels. I think it's very, very possible that God is going to let us throw angels into the lake of fire. I think it's possible. But only if godly sorrow is in effect. For those of you with addictions, there really is hope. My advice to you is have as much patience with God as you want God to have with you. In 20 years from now, maybe 10 years from now, maybe 5 years from now, maybe a year from now, you'll write or you'll call. I got down on my face before God and wowie kazow. God delivered me in such a way I never thought was possible. Those saints, I don't do God can do that. God can do that. 